friends. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we're rejoicing and we're glad in it. God of grace, you have given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. Fill us with your spirit that we may celebrate your glory and worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Let us worship together. Good morning. Reading for your hearing, Psalms 9, verses 1, 2, and 10 from the Living Translation. O oh Lord, I will praise you with all my heart and tell everyone about your marvelous things you do. I will be glad, yes, filled with joy because of you. I will sing your praises, O oh Lord God, above all gods. Verse 10, all those who know your mercy, Lord, will count on you for help. For you have never, ever forsaken those who trust in you. Let us pray. Eternal God, Lord, we come to you this morning with hearts of thanksgiving, thanking you for your continuing love, mercy, and grace. Lord, we thank you for protecting our family and loved ones from danger, seen and unseen. Lord, we ask that you forgive us for anything we may have said or done that's contrary to your holy word. Lord, please let your spirit continue to flow throughout this service, touching the hearts and the minds, assuring them that you have heard their cries and prayers, and that you will never, ever forsake us if we continue to trust and believe. Bless the music ministry in a special way as they lift our hearts, our minds, our thoughts, and the emotions towards you. Bless the vessel that will that you have anointed for this hour, that we may be renewed and strengthened to continue to keep our hand in your hand. These things we ask in your Son, the great I Am's name, we pray. Amen.
Allen Temple. Good morning, Allen Temple. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Amen. Amen. For this was a day that the Lord did not promise, but he touched each and every one of us with the finger of love. And so we are grateful for life, health, and strength, the use of our limbs that we can see, that we can smell, that we can taste. We don't want to take any of it, any of it for granted. Amen. So welcome, welcome, welcome to Allen Temple Baptist Church. Uh, it is so good to be worshiping with you for all of those who are watching via live stream, Facebook, type in the chat, let people know, tell them to tune in. We are about to have a mighty good time in the Lord. Amen. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it for the Lord is good. Amen. So let's sing. Let's greet one another from across the aisle. Just wave at one another as we sing. Take it up. seated in the presence of God. So on behalf of our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Uh, Jacqueline A. Thompson, on behalf of our pastor emeritus, the Reverend Dr. J. Alfred Smith Sr., we count it that you are welcome, welcome, welcome. And I am going to toss it over to our pastor right now. Good morning, Allen Temple. This is the day the Lord has made. Is there anybody that came to rejoice and be glad in it? It is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. I don't need everybody, but just a few folk that say, God, I thank you for waking me up another day. I thank you for allowing me to still be here. I thank you that I'm able to come to the house of God. I thank you that despite everything that's going on in the world, you're still good. God, I thank you just for being God, for keeping me for 17 months. God, we thank you. It is good to be in the house of God one more time. You may have your seats if you can. It's good to see you. Amen. I was caught last week in uh, New Jersey trying to run away from Hurricane Henri. Amen. I am grateful that it landed as a tropical storm, but I certainly want to thank publicly Pastor Dwayne Eason for preaching a wonderful word. They told me y'all had real good church last week. And so let me do a couple of things. First, let me acknowledge our public ministries who had a wonderful town hall yesterday. 
It was online around voting, around all of the issues that we've raised before. And so one of the candidates that is running for assembly member District 18 is here with us today. So we thank God for Ms. Mia Banta. Come on, stand up so they can see you. We're glad. Amen. She would be representing our area. And of course, as always, we are always grateful for our district council person. We thank God for Lauren Taylor, who's here with us today. So very grateful for their presence. Some more folks that I will introduce to you at a later time. But what I wanted to do is take this time. I've been talking to you all for the past couple of weeks about a project that I got some funding for and decided to do um, some film shorts called COVID in Black. Do you all remember that? And so I just want to share with you a brief snippet. It's a rough cut. Okay? So critique it real good later. It's a rough cut. But this is COVID in black. And here's how it came about. We thank you, Sister Cynthia Adams from the NAACP. We're grateful for her presence as well today. When the pandemic first hit, the first thing I did was try to research how we responded. How did the world and the nation respond the first time? Because it was new. At first, we thought when they told us it was only going to be a week or two, then a week turned into a month, and a month turned into two months, and now it's 17 months in. What I also did was try and look for the stories of African American people, and I couldn't find any. And so what I said to myself was, is that I do not want something as impactful as the world having to shut down because of a global pandemic and black stories are not told. And so we asked some people to share their stories with us and so a couple of persons agreed to do so. So this is just a rough cut. We have about 15, 20 stories we're going to tell, but I wanna share with you these two this morning. Is that all right? All right, thank you, Reverend Charlotte. My name is Sharifa Winston. Reverend Warren Long, I am the Administrative Manager at Allen Temple Baptist Church. I am an Instructional Support Specialist for Oakland Unified School District, and I have been here at Allen Temple for five years. I have been a member since 2005. At first, I was happy because I'm like, I get a break from work, it's gonna be a couple of weeks, they're gonna fix it, you know? And then as time went on, it became scary. We were shut down the next day or something like that. I was no longer working. My children weren't in school. And um, it just was a scary time, not knowing what was gonna happen. That was pretty quick action here at Allen Temple, shutting down the campus by March 18th. So um, initially my apprehension or my lack of information uh, came to roost pretty quickly and I uh, understood the severity of the pandemic and its growth. I am an outdoors person. I'm kind of restless by nature, so that has seriously changed my habits, my daily habits. Um, having to stay indoors, having to shelter in place, that was really a challenge for me. The new norm is a challenge for me because it seems like it changes every day. You know, we weren't able to, we didn't have to wear a mask. Now we're back to wearing a mask. The COVID numbers are back up because of the, the new strand. And it's just, it's like a roller coaster. I think that it's a trust factor, so I don't know how you mitigate that, but people in the communities of color in particular have been hesitant about testing one and then becoming vaccinated, number two, and primarily about becoming vaccinated. They might be willing to be tested at some point, but there's still a lot of hesitation about being vaccinated. You need to learn about COVID-19 and what can keep you know, keep us safe. I believe testing is something that we need to do, even if you're vaccinated. 
God has sustained me, a forward thinking pastor, because she brought COVID testing to the church and I was able to get a job there. I think Allen Temple being a testing and a vaccination site have been a great um, benefit to the community. First, it's accessible. It's right here in deep East Oakland. So it is accessible to uh, communities where um, who don't traditionally have access to uh, resources or care that other communities have. It's been a great experience, but um, we really didn't get to the whole community around here. A lot of people came, but they were not of this community. And I just think that I wish we could have done um, more outreach or figured out a way to get them here because we're here three days a week, 10 to four. Walk up, drive in, it, it doesn't matter. We were testing and I just think it's very important that we really reach out to our community so that they can know, so they can know that these services exist. That is just a snippet. So we thank the East Bay Community Foundation. These are just snippets of what will go around the world. Hopefully they will be used by churches all across the nation, nonprofit agencies, again, to document the stories of how COVID is impacting African-American communities. Because just when we thought it was going away, guess what? It doubled up and it's still here. But people need to know that there are people who are being impacted. There are people who have caught the disease and they have passed away. There are people who have contracted the disease and they have lived. There are people who are still struggling, still trying to to figure things out and so sometimes when you see someone else's story it helps you feel better about your own story but moreover it is meant to be an instrument to raise awareness and to encourage our people to make healthy choices for their future that we are not listening to the internet we are not listening to YouTube we are not listening to the resident medical school person that dropped out down the street amen we are listening to the science to make decisions that preserve our community amen Amen. Thank you so much as always for your support. And when it becomes a full video presentation, maybe we'll have a little screening or something. Maybe we'll, we'll have an event and have a COVID in black screening. But with that in mind, this is Fifth Sunday, Women's Mission Sunday. And we are so very grateful for all of our mission circles that continue to serve the community, even in the midst of a pandemic. They serve not only here, but they also give and serve abroad. And so this is our opportunity to help them, to help the ministries of this church. It is giving time. Oh, wait a minute. I don't know, that don't sound like blessed folk. I said it's giving time. That's what I'm talking about. Whether you have it to give or not, we are grateful to the God who continues to provide. So we prepare our hearts and minds to give at this time. If you are joining us online, you have an opportunity to give as well. You are more than welcome to go straight to our website and to visit us that way and make your gift known there. We are also accepting gifts by mail. You can send your tithe and your offering in. You can also do it via text message. And for those of you who are in the sanctuary, we are grateful for our ushers who are going to serve us as this time as our, our women's chorus, amen, who has ministered so beautifully will come back before us. But let me say this, Haiti. And so we're grateful for our global missions who have already committed funding to support those who are in Haiti. I will be coming back before you again with a request. We have gotten several requests from several partners that we have in Haiti, but we also recognize it's so much going on. They're bracing for Hurricane Ida as we speak. We recognize those in Tennessee have been impacted, and we haven't even called the name of those in Afghanistan and those who are returning. And so just know that I will be coming before you, but we have not forgotten about Haiti. And here is why it's critical. Dr. Alley, when I landed in New Jersey, I had a driver who was from New York. Typical, typical driver. And so he and I were talking because he soon figured out that I was probably a bit more liberal than he is. And I soon figured out that he was a bit more conservative uh, than I am. And so the conversation he had 
when we started talking about world events, because it's a long drive from Newark Airport to New Brunswick, he brought up Haiti and he said, you know what? And I said, what? He said, it's almost like they're cursed. And so after I breathed and channeled all of the Holy Ghost I could, I recognized perhaps this was a teaching moment. And so we had a very real conversation about the history of nations in this world. We had a very real conversation that poverty does not happen on its own that people who are poor are not cursed by God. There are enough resources in this world for everybody to have what they need to have. The issue is not God, the issue is us. And the way we decide to distribute resources. And so we want people to know, because there's some of us that feel that way. Why do things always happen to Haiti? Oh, it's because they practice witchcraft. Oh, no, we say it. Yes, we do. But they are a people created in the image and the likeness of God. And even when we can't explain the hardship that we experience, we still recognize that they are a people that is loved by God. And so we will be coming back along with Global Missions with a request for Haiti to make sure that they receive the report and they receive the support they need. Because as more things happen, guess what? It gets pushed out the news. Amen. Did I talk long enough for you to write checks? Hallelujah. And fill out envelopes. Y'all didn't catch that filler? Come on. Ushers, we are ready to receive our offering and we're ready to hear from our women's mission chorus today.
blessings flow and they flow and they flow and they flow. Alan Temple and friends, it is time to pray. I invite you to stand where you are, or sit where you are, assume the prayer or posture. Live stream, telephone, I invite you to do the same as we prepare to prayer for these individuals who are listed on our bereavement list as well as our special prayers and for you who are here in the balcony. It looks so good in the sanctuary, on live stream, on the telephone. We pray for Sister Tamia Andrews, past the granddaughter of Sister Valora Lofton. The homegoing celebration is pending. Brother Tyrone Bennett passed, the nephew of Reverend Inita and Deacon Anaton Anasanya. Homegoing celebration will be held in Los Angeles. Brother Johnny Armstrong passed, the son of Deaconess Dixie Roberson and brother of Sister Bobby Horton. Homecoming celebration is pending. Brother Cedric Hughes passed, the brother of Sister Maxine Graves. Homegoing celebration is pending. Sister Ola Masai Kufo Warloa Aina. Forgive me if I misspoke your name, passed. She's the cousin of Reverend Olu and Judge Gail Bariola. The homegoing celebration will be held on September 8th at Trinity House Zion Center in Logos, Nigeria. Brother Royal Odell Taylor passed, father of Sister Deborah Nelson and grandfather of Sisters Taylor and Terilyn Nelson. Homegoing celebration will be held on Monday, August 30th at 11 a.m. at Beth Eaton Baptist Church in Oakland, California. We continue with the bereavements for Brother Marlon Bradford passed the nephew of Sister Marilyn Stewart. Homegoing celebration was held on Saturday, August 28th at Fuché Hudson Funeral Home in Oakland. Sister Lily Horton passed, the mother of Sister Gloria Holmes. Homegoing celebration was held at Fuché Hudson Funeral Home in Oakland. We have special prayers for Sister Benny Banks and family, Mother Jessie Brown, Sister Mary Hill, Sister Jacqueline Jackson, Sister Loretta James, Sister Jean Love, Sister Eva Moulton, Brother Closter Sims, Brother William Thompson, I want to remind you, you can send your prayer requests via email to prayer at allen-temple.org or you can call, you can call right now, 510-544-8910. With all hearts and minds clear, I encourage you to put your prayer request in the chat. If you're joining by Facebook, there's someone there that will pray with you, with me as we're praying. Please join me in prayer. Eternal God, we come recognizing you as God Almighty and saying thank you. Thank you for today, a day we've never seen before and a day we will never see again. Lord God, I thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to come together as a collective body to cry out to you. You said, if my people will come together and pray that you will be here with us. Holy Spirit, I invite you to throw your weight around in the name of Jesus. There is some 
someone here, Lord, that's been crying out to you all night. You said that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. We welcome joy to the situation right now in the name of Jesus. I invite you all to lay your burdens down right where you are. The Lord said, cast all your cares onto me because he cares for us. He said to take his yoke upon you and to learn of him for his ways are easy and his burdens are light. Lord God, you don't give us the spirit of fear, yet many of us are afraid. We are afraid of the pandemic. We're afraid of the natural disasters. We're afraid of the violence that is in our neighborhood. And Lord God, we just come standing right now in the name of Jesus, asking for peace, peace that passes all understanding, peace that calms our hearts and mind, peace that gives us that unspeakable joy. Lord God, you said that when we're weak, you'll make us strong. Many are weak, Lord God, for day in and day out, they're showing up, pouring out of empty cups. I just ask that you fill them now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, I lift up families to you in the name of Jesus. Many are doing the best they can with what they have, and yet it feels like it's not enough. Lord God, I just thank you that you are our provider. Provider. And I thank you that you will continue to provide for all of our needs in the name of Jesus. Lord God, I would be remiss if I didn't lift up the state of New Orleans as they prepare for Hurricane Ida. But I also want to lift up the Haiti, hallelujah, in Afghanistan, Lord God, in the state of California, who is still on fire in the name of Jesus. Lord God, have your way. Have your way in our lives, Lord God. Let us continue to be the light that you have called us to be. Lord God, thank you that we are allowed to be your hands and feet on earth. So be with us now, oh God. I lift up those who were on the bereavement list. You heard their names, Lord God. I just ask that you comfort their families in the name of Jesus. We know that grief stays on longer than many know, Lord God. So even those who have lost loved ones as a result of this pandemic, I ask that you be with them now. Comfort them in the name of Jesus. And then, Lord God, there were those on the special prayer list. You heard their names, and I'm going to add one, Lord God. We lift up our pastor, Reverend Jacqueline A. Thompson, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for her leadership. I ask that you pour a fresh anointing on her, Lord God. Thank you for the vision that you have given her to lead us through this pandemic and beyond. In the name of Jesus, continue to protect her from all hurt, harm, and danger. Lord God, I ask that you put your hedge of protection around all of us, around our homes, around our communities, around our families, around our health, around our finances, around our children and their education. Lord God, continue to let your word be a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. And we'll be sure to give you all the glory and all the praise. In the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Say yes through the storm and the rain through 
sickness and pain. I'll say yes, I'll say yes, I'll say yes, I'll say yes. I'll say yes, I'll yes, 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 grateful to God for our women's course that's leading us this morning. Say yes. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. And I decided no matter what I go through, I will rejoice and be glad in it. You all know I really don't need your help. I will bless the Lord at all times god's praise shall continually be in my mouth but it's so much better when somebody magnifies the lord with me come on let's exalt his name together because despite what you're going through the lord is good and the lord is good all the time come on keep clapping i promise you i'm not going to be before you long but i want to welcome home sister joyce who is home visiting from Florida and singing today. We thank God for you. Amen. Keep clapping. We have a number of those who are visiting with us today, and we're so glad to have them. Sister Latifah, amen. We know you even in a mask. Amen. We thank God for Latifah Simon, social justice advocate. Bishop Matthews, Bishop George is with us today. We thank God for him. I know I'm missing some folk, but I promise I will get you later. So here's what's going on. Because I sent a video, I asked you all to join us, and even though we're limited capacity, I know you've been wondering, okay, well, what's going on? People are walking around, <laughs> what's, what's going on? And so we are grateful today. I'm going to be brief, because there are two people that I want you to hear from. The first is our very own Congresswoman Barbara Lee. 
who will be joining us in a bit. We want to hear from her and then we want to hear from our very own governor, Governor Gavin Newsom. And so both of them will be with us today in just a few moments. And so I think it's important in these days and times that we hear from our leaders. And I think it's, I am grateful that they are consenting to be here. I can't tell if that's Brother Wiley or not under that mask. So I'm not going to say nothing. I don't know if it is. And so if it's not, I'm going to just keep looking over here. Amen. But that's why you see some faces here that you've never seen before, because we're at a critical time in our state. And I will speak about that more later, but just know we're at a critical time in our state. And to be at a critical time in California means we are at a very critical time in our nation. And so last time I raised this for you, I stood before you and said, do the right thing, right? That's what I, that's what I said. I said, do the right thing. And I meant that. But we recognize we are here for worship. And so there is a word from the Lord, if you don't mind. I promise you, Dr. McLean, it's going to be 10 minutes. Watch me. Okay, 15, 15. <laughs> I'm going to try real hard. I really am Deacon Carter. Come on, we're going to the Word of God familiar text. And I pray it will be a source of encouragement to your hearts, even briefly. We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'll be reading for your hearing verses 8 and verses 9, then jumping down to verses 16 through verses 18. This is the New King James Version, which I do not usually do. Um, but we're going to do it, as my grandmama would say, because it sounds like the Bible. That's what we're going to do. It sounds like the Bible. So hear ye the word of the Lord. The Bible says, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken. Is this anybody's testimony? Struck down, but not destroyed. Skipping to verse 16, Paul says, therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing or decaying, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. 17 says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us, far more exceeding an external weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, that's why we're people of faith, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that are not, for the things that are seen are temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. So y'all may not get it, but you know I like it like that. So just look at somebody and say, don't lose heart. Come on, tell somebody else next to you, don't lose heart. As you take your seats, tell somebody, don't lose heart. I was praying and asking the Lord what God would have me to share, and that is the word that God dropped in my spirit, don't lose heart. So by way of a holiday, I don't know who's timing me, Deacon Periliad, I don't know, y'all got iPhones and iWatches, you can time me. They didn't stop me at right about seven minutes, <laughs> we'll see. But one of my favorite books that are written about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., believe it or not, are not the ones that chronicle his ministry or chronicle the I Have a Dream speech or all of the things that we know Dr. Martin Luther King for. But my favorite book, Miss Sandra, written about Dr. Martin Luther King is the book called Death of a King. It was written and really co-authored with Tavis Smiley. And the reason why it's one of my favorite books about him is because it is not the book that chronicles where he's sitting on top of life. It is not the book that chronicles where he is well loved. It is a book that details the last 365 days of his life from April 4th, 1967 to April 4th, 1968. We see a very different picture 
of Dr. Martin Luther King, because people seem to believe that somehow when you serve or when you're public or when you're trying to live for God that you're always up. But is there anybody honest enough to say that as blessed as I am and, and as wonderful as life is that there are times, sometimes, when my heart is down and when I get discouraged and, and I look around and I wonder why things are the way they are. I don't need everybody, just a few honest saints that could say with my wonderful degree and all of my pedigree and all of my social connections, there are still days when I wonder what is going on in the world. This is the period where they chronicle a Dr. Martin Luther King who struggled with depression and who struggled with discouragement and who struggled with despair. Why? Because life changed for him. He had already passed two landmark pieces of legislation in partnership with President Johnson, the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, but then there was the Vietnam War. And so on April 4th, 1967, he stood in Riverside Church in New York and he gave that speech beyond Vietnam where he lifted up what he called the three demons of racism, militarism, and capitalism and said to the same President Johnson that we don't have any business sending black people to go fight other people of color when they come back to their own country and don't have any rights here. But the problem is, the same people that stood on the mall and clapped and paraded him when he said, I have a dream, <laughs> are the same people that turned their backs on him when he told the truth about an area that was close to them. Don't you know the world will change? And that people that you think would support you the entire time will be the same people that turn on you? This is a different Martin Luther King. It chronicles how black bourgeoisie and middle class folk, that's us. Some of us, amen. Some of us faking bourgeoisie. We just as hood as we want to be. We just faking it. Same people who said, why don't you leave that alone? Why are you stirring up trouble? President Johnson has been our friend. Why are you taking it this far? But when you are really called to lead, and when you are really called to serve, you recognize that your allegiance is not to any one individual, but to a mission and a purpose and a cause that advances the well-being of everybody. It's a different Martin Luther King. And yet, even in the midst of all of that, he still continued to push for our freedom and push for justice. I said, Lord, you have to help me. Help me understand how, when it seems like the people closest to you, even the people in SLC turned on him. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference folk turned on him. And yet he still continued to fight on our behalf. Still continued not to lose heart, still continued to show up in Memphis not knowing that the 12 months after the day he gave that speech would be the day he is assassinated at the Lorraine Motel. I think he understood some things. He understood some things that Paul understood. I promise you, I'm going quickly to the text because the hour is leaving. Paul, by the time he writes this text in Corinthians, had been beaten five times, whipped, beaten with a rod three times, stoned three times, abandoned by his entire family, had pressures from the church every single day, and yet he said, we are perplexed, and we are crushed, but we are not in despair, and we are not destroyed. Then he came back and he said, don't lose heart. I said, Lord, just, just help me so I can just say something in terms of a homily that helps the people. Here is how you not lose heart. When you sit and watch the news and you cry for the women and the girls of Afghanistan because the Taliban has told them that you have to stay in your home because the soldiers are not trained to honor and protect you. Here is how you continue not to lose heart when you recognize that the same thing, the voting rights that Dr. King fought for and got passed, we still fighting for today. 
How do you not lose heart when you have a lieutenant governor of a whole state that stands up and say the state got COVID because of black people? How do you lose heart? How do you not lose heart? When it seems like every single gain we have made is slowly being rolled back, how do you not lose heart? When it seems like we've lost our sense of decency and respect, how do you not lose heart? When you have to fight with people to cover their face so they don't kill nobody else, or that they themselves don't end up being killed. How do you not lose heart? Paul says, even though our outward body, Congresswoman, is decaying, our inward man is being renewed day by day. Mess me up. Because I couldn't get excited about what's happening on the inside when there's so much happening on the outside. But then I had to remember where I came from. How I descend from a people that was snatched from the coast of Africa and placed on the bottom of ships and they still maintain their resolve. How they did not speak the language, how they endured the waters of the Middle Passage and they still maintain their resolve. How they lived through brutal chattel slavery for 400 years and they still maintain their resolve. How even through Jim Crow and even through discrimination and segregation, they still believe that God was going to show up for them. Because they knew what needed to recur to renew their spirit day by day. So I challenge you. What are you doing every day to renew your spirit? That's why we come to the house of God. That's why we sing the songs and clap our hands. That's why we dance if we have to and shout if we have to and scream if we have to. Because it renews my spirit. And as long as my spirit is strong, there is nothing outside of me that can deter me or break me. Let me tell you about a spirit. The Bible says it is the spirit of a person that sustains them. And my mother, trusty night, y'all know, living with dementia, but God is faithful and kind. Her body, she's so small, y'all. She's still cute. But she real small. And so my sister and I, because whenever you're caregiving, right, sibling stuff comes up. And so my sister is a licensed clinical social worker, and that's how she approaches the situation. And I'm not. So that's how I approach the situation. But here is one thing that I learned. If I were to just look at her, which I know is what doctors did, they pronounced death over her in December. But she's still here. Because when I walk in the room, the first thing I want to do is look in her eyes. And when her eyes meet my eyes, if she still ekes out a smile, I know her spirit is still in her. Because if your spirit is strong, then you can withstand anything that is thrown against you. But sometimes we pay more attention to our bodies and our families and our minds than we do our spirits. But he said, even though my body is decaying, my spirit is strong. Even though it seems like everything is falling apart around us, isn't it good to know that you still got somebody that's still working in Washington right now? I thank God for Congresswoman Lee, for her spirit, for her resolve, for the length of time that she served. I thank God that in 2021, God vindicated her because she told you 20 years ago not to go into Afghanistan and you went anyway. We thank God. But do not be deceived. It is because she is a spiritual woman. Yeah. 
who will pray and seek prayer. So for those of us who have been called to lead and all of us who have been called to serve, one of the ways you don't lose heart is you have to remember that your spirit is being renewed every single day. And just like you grab that cup of coffee, just like you grab that meal, grab something that's going to renew your spirit. Paul goes on to say, because I know I'm over my time. Huh? I know, I see the clock. Okay, all right, I'm coming. I promise you, I'm going to be done before he get here. Watch. The second thing he said, he said this light momentary affliction messed me up. Because some of the things we go through don't feel light. And the battle to convince people that black lives really do matter don't seem short. But I said, God, how is it that Paul can say that this light momentary affliction, don't even worry about it because it's working for you a greater exceeding weight of glory. Mess me up. Because I always have to go back to my upbringing, Bishop. And what they used to tell us when I was growing up, the saints used to say, trouble don't last always. And you didn't really understand it when you were younger, but when you got older and lived a little bit, is there anybody can look back over their life and recognize that trouble really don't last always? But here is the beauty of the text. What Paul was really trying to teach the people is that your affliction has the ability to work for you. Because scripture says God makes all things work together for our good. Them that are called according to God's purpose that love God. Mess me up because you mean my trouble can work for me? That's what Joseph didn't understand. Joseph thought that when he was in prison that what God had spoken over his life was over. But little did he know that that momentary time he spent in prison was the same amount of time that God needed to set up and prepare the circumstance that was going to land him in the middle of the palace. All you have to do is believe that God is able to take whatever affliction, whether it's in your body, in your family, in your marriage, in your community, God is able to make trouble work for your good. God is able. I remember when we needed testing, Ms. Bonta here in East Oakland. And we had called Alameda County, Council Member Taylor can tell you. They said we don't have no tests. And so me being who I am, y'all pray my strength in the Lord. I called everybody I could think to call. I emailed everybody I could think to email. I offended everybody who could be offended. Because sometimes you need a little trouble. Isn't that what Congressman John Lewis meant? Make good trouble. And some of us are here today living the way we are living because there were people who decided to make good trouble on our behalf even though they would never live to benefit from the good trouble they made. And so we owe it to the generation that comes behind us to make as much trouble as we need to make to make sure that they experience what God has actually called them to. It's a momentary affliction, but it's working for our good. Last thing, I promise you I'm done because I'm over. He goes on to tell them. He said, because we don't focus on what we see. We focus on what is unseen. Because what you see is temporary. But what you don't see is eternal. It is the same as when he came back and said, we walk by talk to me and not by because when we focus our attention on what we see then we get caught up in despondency and despair and what can never happen but when you focus your attention on what you don't see 
then you are able to envision and to dream and to imagine. Who would have thought right here in the middle of deep East Oakland where they said nothing good was coming out of here that God would plant a church that would start as a little church on the corner and then become a bigger church and then give it a family life center and then cause it to... So I always say, when you're driving around, what do you see? I believe East 14, because I'm not on International Boulevard quite yet. It was East 14 when I left. I see Piedmont Avenue. And the only reason it can't be Piedmont Avenue it's because of the limitations of what we see. I don't wanna have to go to San Leandro to get gas. Or to sit down at a white tablecloth restaurant. Or to be able to get fresh food. But if you focus on what you see, then it will become changed to you. But aren't you glad that you descended from people that saw you free, that saw you with all of the inalienable rights that you deserve, that saw something for you that they didn't even realize for themselves? And no matter how hard it was, even when they were sick and tired of being sick and tired, they still continued to fight so you could have the future that they saw even though they didn't have it them. You have to be able to see the invisible. We built black colleges in the basement of churches, seeing the invisible. We started banks when they wouldn't keep our money and give us loans, seeing the invisible. Inventions when they were not present in the earth because we see the invisible and when you are able to see the invisible then you know not to lose heart because the same God that raised Jesus from the dead that same resurrection power is still at work today so that's why I get excited when they say, you can't do that. She can't do that. They're not going to be able to manage that. Just give it a little time. It's not going to work out. Keep talking. Because the God I serve is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all I could ever ask. Think, do I have anybody that believes God is able to do anything but fail? We stand here today. Because God has been faithful even when we have not been faithful. So the Lord says, don't lose heart. Come on, Reverend Shaw, put it up for me one more time. Verse 8 and verse 9. Let me, let me see it. We have to remember. We are hard pressed. If it was one side, Reverend Moody, I could take it. <laughs> but we hard pressed on every side. Yet we're not crushed. <laughs> we are perplexed. But we are not in despair. Persecuted. Lord knows. <laughs> but we are not forsaken. King James Version says, cast down, but we are not destroyed. Therefore, verse 16, don't lose heart. I promise you I'm done. I don't know if our guest is here or not. Is he here? He's on his way? Okay. All right. So this is who this is for. Because people email me during the week and I write back. 
And so one of our members, her name is Rachel. Hi, Rachel. She is a nurse in San Francisco. And so she stayed on my mind, and so I sent her an email, and she wrote back to tell me how challenged healthcare workers are right now and how depressed they are because they are being overwhelmed in the hospital. She's a young woman out here by herself, no family. Had another issue, someone in my family who's dealing with something. Stuff just going on all around. But even though you all are not present with us, the same word is for you, don't lose heart. Because I promise you, on the other side is your struggle is exactly what God has promised. And you got proof right here, it may take 20 years, but they will have to come back and say she was right. <laughs> so on this day, we invite you, whether you're in the sanctuary, whether you're joining us online, listen. It's lots of things we need to be safe in these days and times, and a mask is one of them. But even greater than that is a relationship with God. So if you don't know anything about what I was talking about, that is my first conversation and invitation to you. You need a relationship with Jesus Christ. I promise you, it does not make you immune from trouble. Sometimes it can feel like when you have relationship, you get more trouble than you had beforehand. But what it does guarantee you is that you have somebody who will be with you every single step of the way. Second invitation, if you are here and you don't have a church home, there are many, many wonderful churches in the area. But I can testify about this church that I joined when I was 12 years old, right there in the balcony, eating candy, looking at Dr. Smith singing, not listening to nothing he said. And even then, God was at work in our lives. If the pandemic has taught us nothing, it has taught us the power of community and the benefit of community. We would love to be your church home if you would love to join us and become a part of us. You can type right there in the chat and somebody will reach out to you. Last invitation, maybe you're here and you just need somebody to connect with you because you have something that is crushing you on every side. We are grateful for our clergy that are here. We're grateful for our deacons. We have praying and preaching deacons who are able to serve and to minister to you at this time. So we're gonna sing a little bit. We're going to believe God, and then we are going to move with the next part of our service. I'm so glad trouble don't last always. Save me, Sandra. Oh, I'm so glad trouble don't last always. Come on, y'all, help us sing it. I know the congresswoman looking like, why is she giving me a mic? But we have not seen her. And we are happy to see her. Amen. And we want to hear from her. So we are going to transition a bit. I need, is she's going to come wipe the pulpit down for me? But we do know our congresswoman has been hard at work here and abroad fighting not just for her district, but she really does fight for all those that are in need. So we want you to know we love you, we support you, we pray for you, we thank God for you. Come on, let's welcome Congresswoman Barbara Lee.
honor to God. He is the head of my life and to Pastor Jackie. Let me just uh, say to you, my spirit is renewed. And I just have to uh, thank you so much for not only your Christian leadership, but your civic leadership, and for what you and my Allen Temple family have done to save lives in our community. That's what it's about, and, and souls. <laughs> so it's good to be back home. I don't know where to start. It has been quite a remarkable, um, very sad, very treacherous, very deadly two years. But we stand here today because we know it's by the grace of God <laughs> that we've been able to weather this storm. And I uh, just want to say for a moment, I want to thank you so much for your prayers because I've been up through a lot, as you know. I was sitting as close as I am to you when the, on January 6th when those white supremacist terrorists invaded the Capitol. And I heard from many of you. And again, it was only by the grace of God that I survived that. And so I just want to thank you for your prayers. I know the power of prayer. It's constant. And I'm here today to just say to you how important it is to vote no on this recall. It's so important. For many reasons, but we know good and well that we all said that the last election was the most important election of our lifetimes. Well, I want you to know, here we are again, because we know who they are, and they are targeting California now to take over not only the state, but the entire country. Now, you know who they are. We know that. And so it's so important that we educate our community about why it's important to just vote no on the recall. And I just have to say a couple of things just about our governor, because I know him well. He has been a governor, and you can ask anybody who knows his record, who has supported the black community like none other, like none other. He has stood up for our lives, for our health care. He has stood up for our community, our small businesses, our black owned businesses. His record is phenomenal. So for no other reason, we should vote no on the recall. And so thank you all so much for it welcoming him here to my home church because he knows that here in Allen Temple, not only do we pray, but we work. So thank you again and may God bless you. Amen. While we are waiting, the governor is here, but I said I could have preached a little longer if I knew you was going to have me preaching no homily. What? We have so many special guests that are with us. I want to make sure that I acknowledge everybody. So if you are visiting with Alan Temple today in whatever capacity you are in, won't you stand so we can greet you properly? Amen. Amen. I know I've recognized some of you as well. Amen. So we're going to have to do old, old school, old school church. So remember back in the day? So you'll have to tell me, because I don't know nobody in a mask. So you have to tell me who you are and where you're from. Amen. We're expecting you. Assembly member Mike Gibson from Southern California. We thank God for you. Amen. You're not sneaking in, sir. You're not sneaking in. <laughs> that's, not, that's not how any of this <laughs> works. Come on, help me celebrate the presence of our governor, Governor Gavin Newsom. We thank God for him. I told them I could have preached a little longer had I known. 
But we are so very grateful to have you here today. We are going to wipe the pulpit down again and bring you forward. But let me just say this to you publicly. On behalf of all of our leadership and our membership, welcome to Allen Temple Baptist Church. And let me thank you because it was your work, your advocacy, your leadership at the state level and with Cal OES that allowed us to have a partnership in a vaccination here where we've been able to vaccinate over 60,000 people. There were people, even though we were instrumental in working for the mass site that happened at the Coliseum, there was a constituency that was just not gonna go. And so we are so very grateful for your advocacy, for your leadership, for your commitment. We love you, you are amongst friends, so you don't have to convince and preach to the choir. We want you to know that we support you, but we do wanna hear from you around why this is so critical and moreover, the impact it can have for African American people. And so the church can tell you, not even knowing this moment was going to take place, that's how, why we believe in divinity, because they can tell you two weeks ago, I stood on my head in the pulpit <laughs> around how people use and manipulate us. And how we have to be mindful of the way people attempt to manipulate us. So we welcome you to our pulpit. We're gonna make sure that we wipe it down and we wanna hear from you. Thank you again for being with us. Amen. And then I know he won't mind, y'all won't mind if we pray for him before they leave. Is that all? All right, all right, welcome. Good morning, church. Now, I know the pastor was just preaching about good trouble, but I think I'm in real trouble being this late, so forgive me, all of you. Those of you with kids, though, may have a little empathy. I got four of them, and uh, I wish I had three of them this morning because there was one that was acting out, and forgive me for being late, but uh, I'm here. Uh, you know, it's been a hard year. It's been a hard year and a half. The empathy goes out not just to parents, but to each and every one of you. This has been hard. The fear, the anxiety, the stress that so many are still feeling. This has been hard. And the pastor, she's right. She talks about how in moments like these, there are people that want to divide us that want to manipulate that fear, that want to manipulate that anxiety, that want to take advantage, that talk down to people, talk past people, try to put us in boxes. But the Bible teaches us we are many parts, but one body. <laughs> and when one part suffers, we all suffer. No one said it better than Dr. King. He said, we're all bound together by a web of mutuality. There's no leak on your side of our boat. What makes us great is when we live together and advance and prosper together across every conceivable difference. That's what makes us great. It's not when we tolerate each other. It's when we celebrate each other. But there are forces of fear that try to manipulate and divide. And none of us are naive about that. Alan Temple's not naive about that. That's why you created a Spanish ministry, reaching out the Hispanic community because you have a deep recognition of the world we're living in. We are living in the most diverse state in the world's most diverse democracy. We are unmatched anywhere in the United States of America. That's a point of deep pride. But in 1994, you may recall the same forces that are alive today were alive here in the great state of California. Think about 1994. Think about the choice you had on a ballot. The xenophobia, the nativism, the fear of the other, three strikes and you're out. What was that about? Prop 187. The debate, the raging debate, UC Regents, the raging debate in 1994 was about eliminating affirmative action. We were having a hard time tolerating each other. 
let alone celebrating each other in 1994. We thought that was our history, not our present. But we've seen those dark forces return not only in the state, but all across this country in the last four years, the xenophobia, the nativism, the fear of the others. We told you all, Congresswoman Barbara Lee said this, Simon Gibson said this, we all said this last November, the most important election in our lifetime. <laughs> and it was true. But we may have defeated a candidate, but we didn't defeat his cause. Trump may have been defeated, but Trumpism is still alive all across this country. Those same forces have reemerged, even here in the state of California. It's 1994 all over again. The reason, the reason that we have an election this year is because someone decided that he wasn't going to take it anymore. He said he was sitting there watching TV, blurry eyed, turned it on and he saw all these folks up there pushing back against what was happening in Washington, D.C. He couldn't believe it. and he said he was going to do something about it. He started to get a petition out there, started to get people to sign that petition because he doesn't like the diversity in this state. He doesn't like the fact we're trying to do more on health care and education. Regardless of your race and ethnicity. And so he came forward and put a petition on the ballot and it's now on the ballot September 14th. This is the same gentleman, just because you think I may be exaggerating, the person who put this on the ballot said he wants to microchip all immigrants in California. I want to remind you, church, 27% of this state is foreign born. He wants to microchip, just to be fair, let me use his words. He wants to microchip immigrants because he says it works, quote unquote, for animal control. That's what we're up against. That manipulation, pastor speaks of. But we're better than this. And this is our moment to express ourselves, to reject that cynicism, to reject that negativity, to push back against those that want to divide us. Look, I'm proud of this state and I'm not naive. I'm not naive about the challenges we face as a state and a nation. None of us are naive about that. But I'm proud to live in a state that's the only state in America that attaches itself to a dream. There's the American dream and the California dream. There is no other state that has a dream. That's California. A majority minority state, a state of refuge. A state at its best celebrates that diversity. It reconciles all those differences. And yes, stubbornly tries to do more and do better. And we have a lot of work to do. We're living in the richest and poorest state in our union. We recognize our responsibility. And so I'm here humbly, you know, not only as a father of four, but as a guy who grew up in this community just across the bay, someone mindful of our past, our present, but more importantly, our potential. Not who we are, but what we can be. And so I ask you, in the spirit that was expressed today by the pastor, that spirit of citizenship and civics, to be active, not inert, on September 14th. To be fully participatory. It has been said, and I'll close, that in a democracy, the most important office is not governor, 
It's not congressman. It's not assembly, mayor. In a democracy, the most important office is office of citizen. So I ask all of you, church, I ask you to be as scripture teaches us. To be fully participatory. To fight for the life of the city, our state, our nation, and more importantly, the world we're trying to build. By expressing yourself loudly on September 14th. By getting out and voting and rejecting this cynicism, rejecting this fear, and voting no on this recall. Thank you all very, very much. Man. Please stay right, stay right there. Stay right there. Governor, stay, stay right there. Let me give you an elbow. You are not in trouble. You're in good trouble. I'm in good trouble. <laughs> Again, we are so very grateful that you came to speak to us today because Allen Temple Baptist Church knows that I don't do this. This is not what I do. But the reason I did it is because there are so many people who come through election time. I grew up here, we used to host them. And they would come during election and we would never see them again. But here is what you do not know. Every time I've reached out to someone at the state level, when we needed something here, they responded. That is what let me know that we have someone different. Homegrown like I was. Came in two and a half years ago, landed on a pandemic like I did. <laughs> so it has not been easy, but we are grateful. No, there is a contingent that supports you. And we will not leave because we are a people of faith. Congresswoman, if you can join us. There are other leaders that are here as well. We're people of faith, we believe in God, and so we pray. That is what we do. I'm so very grateful for all of our deacons who came early, who made sure our campus was set, who served, so that we can have this moment. We know you have other places to be with friends and colleagues. But I descended from a people who when they didn't have government and they didn't have representation, they had a faith. And so we call on God right now in this moment. And we thank you for your goodness to us. Even in the midst of pandemic times where it feels like all the world and the earth is in travail, you are still good. And you have blessed us. I come in a ministry of intercession praying for leaders, oh God. I pray for our governor, I pray for our congresswoman, I pray for our council member, I pray for those that are running. Every leader in this place, because your word commands us to do so. God, you said that you would give us leaders after your own heart. So I lift them before you now and I pray for your protection, not just of their bodies, but of their spirits and of their mind. I speak strength to both of them to be able to withstand the fiery attacks that come every day. Oh God, I speak peace to their spirits to give them to know that before you formed them in their mother's womb, you created them with purpose and they are living out their purpose even now and I declare that you are not through with them yet. So we thank you in advance for victory. We thank you for lives that will be changed because of their work. We thank you for leading them and guiding them, oh God. Be a reminder of what it was like growing up in Marin. Be a reminder of those early days in Texas, oh God. Only you can lead us and guide us at this hour. But I thank you for their voice and I thank you for their courage and I thank you that even when they stand alone, you stand right up with them. I thank you. And I ask, oh God, that you continue to lead and guide. And for those of us who are struggling with participation, prick our hearts and give us to know we have responsibility. 
if not for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren, for generations that are unborn, to leave them a nation and a world that is better than the ones that we inherited. We thank you for it now. And we believe it, oh God. And we declare, don't lose heart. God is with us. In Jesus' name. Now, just a few things. Start. The ushers in that regard. We know that the governor is going to be with. And so we.